I think that just as we're living in a nuclear age, we have grown so tremendously in scientific knowledge, it doesn't seem uh, too much to say that men can begin to awaken to the fact that they have, haven't grown enough spiritually and haven't recognized their spiritual capacities. Once something like eating is death, then you've struck at the very heart of life. The enemy of the older radical theories may have been the ruling class, but today the stakes of whether we will reform ourselves into a new kind of human being, a new kind of society, whether we will find selves worth being, the stakes of it are simply life itself. Modernity has created promises that it has no ability to keep. What this means is that we're a society of disembedded individuals um, stuck in the impossible situation of being alone together. And what was understood as emancipation has proved to be a form of isolation. It is important to understand that what I am telling you is not simply a cultural history. It's a description of the story that shapes every single person that you know. This is why there is a rise in mental illness. It's absolutely concurrent with the disembedding of the individual because individuals can't constitute themselves by the very nature of the case. Subjectivity cannot sustain its own weight. We need others to tell us. But we've been given an ethical mandate by the Enlightenment that tells us that that's immoral, that nobody should constrain us. We're back for episode five of season two of Dust Bowl Diatribes. And we have with us a special guest, Swan Sana who's a former student of mine and has a really interesting background. Um, and so the first thing I wanted to do is just ask Swan to introduce himself and tell us a little bit about um, your background, how you got to where you are today, where you're doing, uh, uh, among other things, intellectual Catholicism as a YouTube channel. Um, so just tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, well, let me begin by thanking uh, Dr. Lori Johnson and Spencer for having me on the uh, channel. You know, it's funny because what is it? I'm not I'm no longer your student, Dr. Johnson, but I still want to call you Dr. Johnson because Lori just doesn't feel right to me. Thanks. So yeah. <laughs> get that a lot, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I run a YouTube channel and podcast called Intellectual Catholicism. I was out for a few months discerning with the Dominicans um, in their novitiate, but I eventually discerned out. And so I came back and the channel before was called Intellectual Conservatism. And then I moved it to intellectual Catholicism. Um, I studied philosophy at Kansas State University, and I, I finished my uh, applications for grad school, and I'm hoping to study New Testament and early Christianity. Cool. Could, could I ask you why you changed the name of the channel? Yeah, so um, I, when, when I came back from the Dominicans, I think, I mean, it, it already, like, if you were watching um, all the content on the channel before I left for the Dominicans. It was very like Catholic apologetics, philosophy, theology oriented. And I realized that uh, my conservatism originally began as kind of this broad kind of Scrutonian, Roger Scruton, Roger Scruton kind of conservatism. And then as time passed, I started feeling more drawn actually to my Catholic faith and seeing like, oh, Catholicism isn't just like this religion that you put in one corner and then the rest of your life goes on. And, you know, it's like, no, it's a whole worldview. And eventually I saw that, you know, Catholicism became just everything that I really loved and cared about. And so I wanted to kind of have that channel reflect how deeply rooted Catholicism is to the kind of intellectual content that I love and produce. Well, it was, it was a very, like, I thought smooth switch. Um, and it sounds it sounds like exactly what it is. Uh, I really, I think we both um, appreciate your channel. Uh, I think we think you do a lot of, of good work. Um, so like, what is the main aim, would you say, of intellectual Catholicism? You know, tell people like what, what it is that you hope that your listeners are getting from it. Yeah, you know, I view my role as kind of like a curator of just trying to get the best you know, Catholic intellectual content out there. Um, and so part of the mission is, for example, you know, getting really top-notch thinkers to talk about issues in Catholic theology and philosophy, 
making them accessible. Because I think sometimes people have this idea that professors and philosophers and theologians and friars, they're so distant and far away. But my work is trying to let the people have access to this information. Uh, the other thing I'd say, too, is uh, it aims to have dialogue with people who aren't in the Catholic tradition. So it's not just for Catholics. I mean, I've also had Muslim guests on before, and I'm going to have a, a series with a Muslim philosopher named Khalil Andani. We're talking about Neoplatonism and the Trinity next. And then after that, we'll be talking about the papacy and Islamic theology. So it's going to be a lot of fun there. Um, and then uh, the last thing I'll say is... Um, one thing I want my channel to do is kind of avoid the craziness of the online Catholic apologetics world, because sometimes you have people, I don't know if I should name anybody, but people who kind of basically are set of a contest or critiquing Pope Francis all the time and railing against Vatican II. And I would like my channel to not go off the rails in that direction, but actually retain, let's say, Catholic orthodoxy. Real quick, could you define what set of a contest is? Yeah, so said of a contism is the belief that the chair of Peter is empty. So literally, you know, said a cont, right? So the chair is empty. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it comes in various forms. Some people will say Pius XII was the last pope. Some people will say <laughs> there's Benevacantism, which has now become said of a contism, where people believe that Benedict XVI was the last valid successor of Peter, and then now the chair is empty. So you have all these kinds of kind of crazy positions. Mm -hmm. And do you have a read on how, I don't want to go too far down this, but I have a suspicion that there are very few actual Benevacontists. Um, do you disagree? Like, is is this a thing that's really out there beyond like, I don't know, Patrick Coffin and maybe Taylor Marshall or something like that? Yeah, I think it's a really small niche phenomenon. You know, usually like if you're a set of a contest, you know, you, you, people typically pick Pius the Twelfth as the last one maybe mm -hmm. Pius the ninth, you know, it depends. What, gotcha. Yeah, I just, so now that we're on this topic, like what do you think um, compels people down that road? Cause I, I'm, I've known people like that. I didn't used to have a name for it. Um, but when I even first moved to Kansas, I met people who um, drew me towards Catholicism. I'm a convert, but I could tell right away there were like, there were theories rolling around in their heads that weren't really, that were sort of tangential to the faith. I wasn't quite sure initially how important that was, mm -hmm. but as time went by, you know, I realized, it, you know, sort of like amounts to kind of conspiracy theory type thinking. And what, yeah, like what is your um, estimation as to what causes people to kind of go down those paths and not remain in orthodoxy, basically? Yeah, I think the, well, I mean, it, you, you know, you'd have to ask a set of a contest and there are all kinds of reasons why they might have that position. But at least from the ones that I know, the reason why they hold to what they believe is because they have a vision based on, let's say, the prior tradition and history of the church of what the papacy is supposed to be, about what the church is supposed to be teaching, about what falls under the magisterium of the pope. So magisterium means the teaching authority, right? So there's this idea that, well, if the Pope becomes a formal heretic, in some way he has vacated his office, right? Or if he teaches something that they deem heretical, then it's, you know, uh, he's no longer the valid successor of Peter. And so a lot of them, I would say, are very intelligent, but also respectfully very rigid. So they think that, you know, there's not a lot of flexibility for error there. If he makes a mistake and, well, it depends on what capacity it is and all that, that basically the chair has been emptied. And so um, a lot of set of a contest uh, rail against Vatican II as a kind of radical rupture in the history of the church with its prior traditions. And so that's usually one place where they'll locate kind of when the chair of Peter ended. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in a way, I mean, I, I sort of think of them as like contemporary Protestants, you know, I mean, because there's this point where they say, you know, my, my understanding of Christianity is different from the churches and therefore mine is, is correct. And theirs must be wrong. And it, it seems mm -hmm. as simple as that to me. So I've sort of seen it that way. I, I mean, as soon as I was exposed to this way of thinking, I thought, 
am I still dealing with a Catholic in a way, you know, because there needs to be a certain level of trust there that the institution will not be guided off course, you know, too far and that you can trust it. Um, and I wonder if part of part of what causes this is just like a general distrust in you know a fairly well-founded distrust in authorities generally in our modern world that then gets pasted back on to to the catholic church yeah 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 i mean i would i would see it as a kind of frustration against like a father figure in a way it's like you were supposed to be this and you didn't amount to it, you know? And so it's just kind of like this weird sense of not wanting to leave the family. They don't want to actually leave the church and be something else, like a high church Anglican or something like that. Right. Um, but they also don't want to be under the current Roman pontiff or, you know, pontiff since Pius Twelfth or what have you, or Pius the Ninth. So it's a really kind of weird limbo position if if i can put it that way at least that's how they perceive it in this kind of like not not in the mainstream catholic but also not outside they don't see themselves outside of the church mm -hmm. they're, they're the faithful remnant still holding on inside of the church yeah right which is basically like a protestant theory as well which was used sure. you know against uh against the church during the reformation mm -hmm. yeah or the orthodox say yeah well, yeah, welcome to 1054. Mm -hmm. um, but I think where this leads into like a pet issue of Lori and mine's is how part of what we find frustrating about it is instead of these people working to like Catholicize or Christianize or or lead ethical lives, period, they're getting sucked into like an online virtual world where they have all their thought experiments and and the debate is, you know, like how how depraved is the Francis papacy or this or that instead of actually like living out uh, the spiritual and corporal works of mercy, basically. Um, would you agree with that or do you have a different take? That's another difficult issue because, you know, I, you know, so I can I know set of a contest online or even some in person. But there's that question of, I don't know what goes on in their personal or spiritual lives, right? But it does seem like there's this kind of obsession with at least being perceived as uber-Orthodox, you know, and, and kind of a negative identity where it's like, I'm not that, and I want you to know that I'm not that thing, you know, and they'll point to, I don't know, uh, Pope St. John Paul II kissing a Quran or something like that, and then they'll say, that's not what I am, you know? So it's difficult to say, um, you know, what's going on spiritually. Although I will say that their reputation is typically a negative identity, not a positive identity of the spiritual and corporal works of mercy that you talked about. Like when I think about a set of a contest, you know, you usually don't really think about <laughs> them doing charity work and all that. Although um, there are set of a contest religious orders out there, not valid religious orders, obviously, but you'll have, I think it's like the sisters of St. Thomas Aquinas or something. Um, where they have their own little convent where they, you know, sing and, you know, produce music and all that, and they live a religious life, but they don't, they're not in communion with the current Pope. Interesting. I didn't actually, I didn't know that there were. Um, yeah. yeah. Huh. There's everything under the sun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I suppose, I suppose that's inevitable. So kind of along the, the same lines, you know, there's been an upswing in, a sort of Catholic traditionalism that's gaining ground, a sort of, um, for instance, uh, among those, they're not set of a contest, but, but they want to return to a Latin mass or something close to it. Um, they enjoy the older forms, um, some attraction to an integralism. Um, mm. So, you know, sort of, as I interpret it, maybe you can tell us your take on this, but sort of a return to a, a close alliance between church and state um, at the very least, or um, maybe even um, the subsumption of state authority under the church. Um, so, I mean, there's, again, there's like a spectrum out there, but I have noticed that there's a growing number of people attracted to 
um, both traditionalism and integralism. And so I think, you know, we both, Spencer and I kind of look at that and we think, you know, there are some good things about that. You know, people are trying to, they're getting serious about their faith um, and they are trying to discern um, the best path for themselves and for the church. At the same time, um, you know, they, they seem out of step with, with the current moment. So we were wondering, you know, what your opinion was of those trends. Yeah. So in terms of traditionalism and integralism, it's important to maybe have a definition, right? So in terms of, let's say, traditionalism, it's really hard to define because one, it's, I think it's a reactionary, it's obviously a reactionary movement. It's reacting to something that they perceive has gone wrong in the church. And it typically falls at the feet of Vatican II. And the idea I think is something like um, in Vatican II and the post-conciliar church, the church tried too hard to win the approval of the world and to open itself up, right? And then before what the church was, was kind of almost, if you will, what they perceive it as like kind of against the world and saying like the world needs to be called to something higher, something greater, right? And um, there was more talk, you know, people talk about how even language changed uh, pre-Vatican II versus post-Vatican II. So before the church used like very objective language. So, you know, it didn't try to, let's say, appeal to your reason necessarily. It tried more to just say, this is the law. This is what we believe. This is the church militant, right? Whereas after the church, or excuse me, after um, Vatican II, there was this idea of trying to kind of meet people where they are and communicate with them there. And, you know, I mean, the anathemas of the previous ecumenical councils like Trent and so forth still stand, but they are not going to be the focus of how we communicate and try to reason with the world, right? So I think traditionalists, they perceive um, a lot of these changes as, as maybe something like embarrassment towards our past tradition, embarrassment towards our identity, um, and in the process, then this kind of hollowing out of what it means to be Catholic. I think what traditionalists want deep down is for Catholics to be proud that they're Catholics, to not feel ashamed, to have reverence, right? And that's a big thing uh, in traditional circles, rev reverence towards the Eucharist, towards the Mass, um, and to follow what the actual books say, right? So, I mean, and I'll say too, kind of just giving my perspective on at least traditionalism, there's something that I respect in that because um, one of the things that I kind of, you know, so recently, one thing that has annoyed me, you know, people talk about, for example, how, let's talk about like the baptism controversy, right? Where you have priests who aren't using the formula properly and technically the sacrament isn't administered. Now it might be by a special grace of God, as the catechism says that, you know, God's not bound by the sacraments, but we are that he could have still um, given salvific grace and sanctifying grace, you know, into the person, even if the sacrament wasn't validly administered. And so when the person dies, it's not going to be like God says, whoops, well, you know, the priest didn't say the right words. So even though you've lived your whole life following me, you know, that's not how it's going to happen. But so like, you want things to be done as they're supposed to be done. You want the words, the law of the church, uh, the beliefs to actually mean something. Right. And so, you know, for me recently, like uh, I've gone on to confession recently on, on two occasions and both times the, the priest didn't give the absolution formula properly. They shortened it. And technically speaking, that's not a valid confession. Then the sacrament wasn't administered. So I had to go to another church to get it done properly. The second time I went to a Latin mass church to get it done properly, you know, so um, all that's to say is that I think traditionalism is a reaction to what people perceive as a kind of shame and hollowing out of Catholicism. And then when it comes to integralism, right, uh, you know, the typical definition of integralism is something like the temporal sword is subject to the spiritual sword. The sword of Peter kind of trumps or is above, sets the standard, the measure for the secular powers. And in this regard, um, I think it goes back to a reaction in the political sphere to the failures of liberalism, to the failures that we could have, let's say, a government that's morally neutral and, you know, kind of, and not, and, and, you know, meet the interests of both 
religious and non-religious people. I think a lot of religious people, especially devout Catholics who have felt the power of the state come down on them, coerce them against their beliefs or attempt to, there's this kind of anger and frustration that they are being pushed out and ignored. And so their reaction is, well, then wouldn't it be better if the state were under the power of the church? Mm -hmm. And again, have you, have you run into a lot of integralists online or is it like uh, DC Schindler and his politics of the real book refers to it as like a thought experiment that it's mostly just online and people saying, wouldn't it be nice if we had like a dictatorship of the papacy? Um, or, or do you, do you think this is a live actual movement, at least within segments of the church? Yeah. I mean, that's a good question. Um, I will say that I have a lot of integralist friends online. So, uh, and I'm even friends online with like uh, some of the kind of top integralist proponents. So people like, for example, the the Dominican friar, Father Thomas Crean, I'm friends with him on Facebook. I've had him on my channel before to talk about integralism. Um, Alan Fimister, I'm friends with him on Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see who else there is. Uh, and then other friends who run their own YouTube channels and podcasts, they'll talk about how they support integralism. But, you know, it does seem to right now be kind of in the thought experiment realm where people are just saying uh, on a philosophical level, you know, wouldn't it be nice and here are the merits of the integralist arguments. And then you have obviously people who vocally oppose it. So I don't know how organized I'd say the actual kind of integralist movement is, but it is, it is something that I've seen online quite often among, especially uh, young Catholic men. Yeah, I think you're right that it, at the very least, it represents a frustration uh, with the whole state of affairs, you know, and the lack of kind of authority in in the world. And so, you know, people ideally, and I mean, I think at least, at least I could say like, if if everything like worked ideally, if the church as an institution ideally acted, right? Mm -hmm. And um, if, if people as Christians ideally did so too, right? Then, then having that kind of um, close integration of church and state would actually be beneficial. Um, mm -hmm. And then the problem is that neither human institution quite rises to, to that level of perfection or ideal and and then you know the thought becomes scary or or you say you know like impossible like it, it remains mm -hmm. in the realm of of thought because it is so like far from the reality of the matter um our society is just so uh, you know partly due going all the way back to the protestant reformation and going forward through liberalism is so um not amenable to true authority is not you know doesn't recognize it at all right mm -hmm. and equates like freedom with not doing so and in that kind of environment even the church is affected by you know the same attitude at least in its actual you know parts um and so in that type of environment i don't even think it, it just, it would, if, if it could possibly happen, which it can't, it, it would not work well, because it, it would only work if everybody was doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing, if that makes sense. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, Actually, yeah, I, yeah. Mm -hmm. go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, that's the, that's the difficulty with kind of all of our political musings, right? Um, and even like, even in ethics, there, there's the people who advocate ideal theory versus non-ideal theory. You know, so some people will say that you can't really universalize and always have an absolute moral principle because, you know, it might be on a case by case basis, right? So maybe you're a situationalist in that way. Um, so I think deep down, though, what you're expressing, Dr. Johnson, was the fact that I think all Catholics are united, or should be at least, all, all Orthodox Catholics are united in the belief of wanting the kingship of Christ. We ultimately want that day to come when Christ is on the throne ruling the earth and we don't have to well one is that the church and the state would be one and the same in the person of Christ you know the priest and the king um and it would be managed by the perfect god man right and then we will and then under the administration of the angels and saints you know and so that would be 
what we want to aim towards, or what, or rather, um, well, that's controversial. We would, we would want that reality to come about one day, right? Now, I think we, what everybody is concerned about, though, is can, sh- like, to what extent should we strive to bring heaven to earth, or to what extent should we allow heaven to do to come on its own time? And and where do you stand on that question? <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's a that's a that's that's such a tough one. So, um, I would say that I think you know. So what, what I'll do is um, kind of on my on my on my view, right? I I think that it's really impossible to run a state without committing to a basic theory of ethics. And, you know, so to, to kind of talk about maybe John Rawls for a little bit, you know, John Rawls talked about how um, in our kind of liberal society, our politically liberal society, there's this idea of public secular reason, where there's a, there are certain kinds of arguments that work in compelling, you know, the public, right? And so if I was to use something like a religious argument from the book of Deuteronomy or Exodus or Leviticus to try and make policy, that wouldn't obviously fly in our in our politically liberal society, whereas it might work in, let's say, a theological circle, right? Um, My idea would be, we can't begin from neutrality. We can't pretend neutrality. We have to already, if we're going to build a society, have a constitution, have law, have a way of reasoning about law and ethics, we have to be clear on some theory. And so I would say that we would have to begin as Aristotelian Thomas under the natural law paradigm, under the classical natural law paradigm. That, so some people say, well, then that automatically means this and that. And it's like, well, no, not necessarily, right? It just means that you have to reason within that framework. Now, that framework will prohibit and make it more difficult to assert certain things, right? So um, to give an example, um, it would make, if you take that classical natural law stance, it would make, for example, kind of, uh, unlimited, unhinged capitalism restricted, right? Because it would take into account the uh, the rights of the poor uh, to have the their natural right to have the excess of whatever wealth there is in a society, right? I mean, Aquinas talks about this. A bunch of the church fathers within the natural law framework talk about this, right? So it would make certain things more difficult to argue for, like if you wanted just to an unregulated free market, right? So you begin with that theory of ethics. And then when we get to the issue of church and state, my position is that the the, the church and state should be in cooperation with each other. And we also shouldn't beat around the bush, you know? And I mean, what what, uh, by that I mean, um, look, the state's gonna take on uh, this kind of natural law perspective that is compatible with the social teaching of the church. But in terms of, let's say, enforcing dogma and doctrines, that's the job of the church to do. The state shouldn't have any role in that. The church should be the social kind of, let's say, handmaiden of the church in that way. It should be supporting, you know, the policies of the church in terms of, let's say, if the church is going to talk about the poor, if the church is going to talk about how usury is immoral, then the, then the state in its, within its framework has an obligation, if you will, to not violate that social teaching or principle, right? So, I mean, I do believe in the cooperation of church and state, um, that there shouldn't just be this awkwardness between both institutions. Um, But it has to be based on, you know, we were talking before about kind of the lecture of, was it Andrew Willard Jones and kind of his root and kind of his work in this area. And he talked about how, you know, before in like medieval society, there was this idea of the relationship between everybody of counsel and aid. And I think something like that on the level of the church and state would be beneficial if the church and the state, you know, saw themselves as providing counsel and aid to each other and somehow working together towards the good of the whole, right? But now the thing that I don't want to happen is the state to, let's say, make Catholicism the religion of the land, right? And force because, I mean, then you get into the issues of re- what, what are the rights of religious minorities in that society? And then typically when integralism has been tried, you know, it, I think naturally intrinsically leads to, the, you know, the suppression of rights of especially the Jewish people. And so I don't want that to happen in our society. Right. 
So there has to be a gentle relationship between the church and state, but a gentle kind of cooperation. And I should just add very quickly that gentle cooperation happens through at least the state endorsing the same basic moral theory as the church, which is natural law theory. Okay. And then, so riffing off that, how would, just hypothetically, how do you think that could ever be brought about, barring basically like revival mass conversion? Um, that that would be because this is where I, I when I when I listen to like Catholic political theorists, uh, they leave that they leave it unsaid. So I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I you know so that's 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 such a huge challenge because you know you got to ask where is this going to happen, right? If we're talking about the United States, then you know we have to deal with then the legacy of uh, of kind of the classical. Well, actually, it's I wouldn't even say it's classical natural law of the classical liberal tradition within our society and the ramifications that, that has, right? So if we were actually gonna practically bring about, let's say this vision of society, mm -hmm. um, we would need some type of mass conversion, right? And we would also need, um, well, I think the first way that you begin the conversion or the revival is if you can show that an Aristotelian to mystic metaphysics is plausible. And that's what um, a lot of people have been doing. So, for example, the philosopher Rob Coons down in UT Austin, uh, I think Alexander Proust and other Thomistic philosophers have been looking at quantum theory, saying Aristotle has been vindicated. And then they're trying to lead to this um, revival of Aristotelian Thomism. And I think if you can do that, and eventually what happens is, you know, as there are, you know, let's say Catholics and other Christians and theists in our society who are tired of, let's say, either moral relativism, or they are tired of a kind of maybe even robust progressive secular moral theory. Maybe it's a kind of utilitarian framework. Maybe you know it's some other form of consequentialism. As the movement kind of goes towards, okay, we need to have a response to progressive secular ideology, and that response is best maintained within Aristotelian Thomas tradition. Then you could actually, <laughs> within at least with among the academics and then the everyday people have a kind of, let's say in their minds, a default of like, no, Aristotelian Thomism is the correct worldview. Law needs to be understood through this moral framework. Then that could become uh, possible. And Robert George, who's a professor, McCormick professor of jurisprudence at uh, Princeton, he's tried to argue that a kind of perfectionism uh, within his natural law framework is compatible with the classical liberal tradition in the United States. Now, you know, there are going to be challenges to that thesis in his book, Making Men Moral. That's what he attempts to argue. And if that thesis is successful, then you could potentially have Aristotelian Thomas among academics and everyday people. Let's say eventually they get into law and they can simultaneously balance, let's say, constitutional jurisprudence with natural law jurisprudence somehow within Robert George's vision. See, I, I dislike the, the tendency to try to mash up these two very different mm -hmm. ways of thinking. I think I agree with DC Schindler from the politics of the real, that the two are antithetical, mm -hmm. that liberalism is a rejection of Christianity, pure and simple, and especially in the institution of the Catholic church. And so they can't be made to go together. I know there's a whole like academic industry trying to make this happen because we mm -hmm. want to preserve our way of life. We want to think of our founding as good and so on. I don't, I don't buy it. Um, and I, I guess I wanted to back up um, and just because I think your points are well taken about um, the Aristotelian framework about natural law, just to make sure that our listeners understand what you're talking about when you talk about the Aristotelian uh, Thomistic framework and natural law. Could you say a little bit more about that contribution? Because a lot of people, especially like Protestants for sure, wouldn't know what we're talking about right now. Like, why is that important? What yeah. is it? So, you know, there's a lot that goes into Aristotelian Thomism, right? But the basic idea is that it is the science of human fulfillment. 
So what it looks at is what fulfills the human person? What are the conditions for uh, fulfillment? What are the goods that we as human beings from our nature naturally pursue and require? And so it begins with a very robust anthropology. Anthropology just means, you know, our study of human nature, how we act, what motivates us, what moves us, how we operate. Um, and uh, and uh, within that, then, it says that we can observe the patterns of human nature and behavior and discern its nature and then actually answer the question, like, what leads to its fulfillment or uh, uh, human's fulfillment and happiness? That's the very simple way of putting it. And then the reason why it's Aristotelian is because it's built within that framework of Aristotle. Um, and then it's Thomist insofar as what Thomas had done was expanded upon Aristotle's kind of moral theory and, and political theory and brought it within a Christian framework. And I'll just say up front too, that even for like Protestant listeners, you might, one might think that, oh, well, it's Aristotelian Thomist and Thomas was a Catholic. So you can't have Protestants who are Aristotelian Thomists. And that's not true. There are many Protestant philosophers who are also Thomists. Um, so it's not necessarily Catholic. But it tends to be associated. Could you, mm -hmm. could you give like one concrete example of, of how this more expansive anthropology and, and what fulfillment would look like, like on any specific yeah. issue? Um, and, and maybe how that contrasts with a liberal anthropology? Yeah, so to give an example, um, natural law theorists, when they talk about, uh, you know, when, so what they do is first they begin with what are the goods that are necessary for human flourishing, right? And so typically they'll list seven. So things like life, knowledge, friendship, um, work, and leisure. Other things on the list are included as well. Uh, religion aesthetics is one of the uh, is another one of them too. So, for example, um, when you look at the uh, let's say Universal Declaration on Human Rights, one of the things that it talks about is the right to leisure, so that people shouldn't be living in a society where they have to work constantly all the time, receive barely any adequate pay, and so that kind of is cyclical, right? Because if you don't receive adequate pay, then you need to keep working to the point where you don't have time for friendship. You don't have time for leisure and work no longer becomes a fulfilling exercise of your powers and faculties, but instead becomes a burden, right? So the, the natural law theorists would actually be willing to justify, if it's necessary, state intervention to, let's say, secure a just wage so that leisure and friendship and the other goods of the human person can be pursued. Um, uh, where, whereas under liberal framework, you know, the idea is that if you think fundamentally human beings are kind of the product of a contract, a rational contract, right? Then the idea is that, well, you sign your name on the dotted line to work this many number of hours, so long as your employer needs it to be done. And if somehow, let's say through the invisible hand of the market, if it has been determined that the most that can be rationally given to you is $5 an hour, and you need to work a hundred hours a week or something like that, um, something crazy, right? Then that needs to happen because it's just simply part of the rational contract. Uh, what a natural law theorist is going to say is, you know, human beings are obviously rational. We have contractual obligations, but the fundamental kind of, let's say, thing that we are all pursuing is the good. And so if the contract, for example, would limit your capacity to pursue the good or be detrimental to the human good, to the common good even, then it needs to be modified. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have to actually think about what will be conducive to our happiness and well-being mm -hmm. prior to making our other decisions. This seems to be the most impossible thing for people to do. You know, I think liberalism is is like such a powerful system because it avoids that question. It yeah. avoids the mm -hmm. question of what is, what is the good life? You know, how ought we to live? And this is where the Aristotelian Thomistic way of thinking does, you know, it's a corrective. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it, it has its own baggage. You've kind of alluded to it, that there are certain conclusions from this framework that people don't like, mm -hmm. um, you know, and therefore, 
because of because of that, because some of those things, like for instance, maybe um, having to do with reproductive rights or something like that, are not um, uh, popular. The whole way of thinking then gets tossed out, right? In favor, yeah, of, yeah in favor of the other. But that is a um, a loss, right? Because the, the the problem with liberalism, it's it's empty. It has no. It has no ability. There is no ability to like give people guidance or define what the good life is. Mm -hmm. um, so we're missing that, you know. And and I don't know how how we ever, um, you know, given given all the landmines <laughs> that I've just alluded to, like mm -hmm. how we get people to be open again um, to that way of thinking. But I I think that you described it very well. Um, mm. And I didn't realize that there were also Protestant um, yeah. Stettelian Thomists out there. The, the most famous one is uh, Norman Geisler. Um, he was an Aristotelian Thomist. Um, I, I, there, there might be some others, but I know that he's like the most famous one, although he's passed away uh, not too long, or I think uh, uh, he's passed, he's, he's gone. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, so, I mean, that kind of, I don't know. Well, Spencer, did you have a question that you wanted to ask? Um, yeah, let me just ask one question just to like sure. tie this discussion up with a bow. Yeah. Um, let me try and rephrase what, what I took you to be saying to make sure, uh, we understood you and see if you have any further thoughts, mm -hmm. um, to realize maybe it would be fair to say you're like a semi integralist that you believe there should be this, <laughs> this back and forth, um, between church and state, the two swords, um, but you don't want to get it you don't want to get to get too totalitarian. We don't want to be repressing the Jews, um, et cetera. Um, and let's say if America gets there in a hundred years or something, it would be because there is, uh, on the part of intellectuals, like a, a widespread conversion to Aristotomism. And then there's a, to, to use, some Marxist terms, there'd be like a primitive accumulation of cadre. You'd get all of these philosopher activists and they'd have a long march through the institutions and they'd they'd change or modify America's juridical framework. Uh, they, they'd manage to do this like neo neoconservative fusion of of Aristotomism with America's liberal framework. And then on that basis, maybe we could have your semi integralist state. Um, yeah. You know, one thing I want to say up front, too, is, um, you know, when I was talking about traditionalism and integralism, um, one thing I wanted to acknowledge was that I think there, there's some truth in what these uh, frameworks are saying or these movements are saying. Just as, for example, in Roger Scruton's book, How to Be a Conservative, he actually goes through socialism, communism, these other frameworks to talk about what he sees as though good and true in them, even if he disagrees with them ultimately, right? And so... Um, as you alluded to me being a semi-integralist, right, there are things that I think are actually good about integralism and that it doesn't beat around the bush about what is to be the, the ethic of society, what is to be the currency within, let's say, our public reason, within our social uh, space, um, and also not beating around the bush about the cooperation of church and state. The, the thing about integralism that I don't like, though, is that it, one explicit part of it is the subordination of the state to the church. and uh, you know, for me that, I mean, one, one that, you know, I remember first hearing like the definition of integralism and how it wants the spirit, uh, this temporal sword to be subordinate to the spiritual. And I'm like, okay, well, that doesn't seem like the right kind of way of looking at things because, you know, grace perfects nature, right? Um, in Christ, he's fully God and fully man. There wasn't a kind of, let's say, subordination there, at least, you know, in terms of the complete uh, the completeness of the incarnate word as being fully man and fully God, right? And so, uh, and, and even the idea really of the resurrection of human bodies and nature being ultimately lifted up to God and to meet him face to face. I think I, uh, you know, so that's why the idea of this kind of subordinate relationship isn't favorable to me, but why I also like the idea of a gentle cooperation where the church and the state can speak the same language because they have the same moral framework. <laughs> now, you also described uh, the movement, right, to kind of convert, if we're talking about the American context, uh, you know, the juridical framework into a kind of 
as you put it, Aristo, or uh, Aristotomism, right? Um, I mean, that's the best shot that I think we have. But I think Dr. Johnson is onto something when she says that, you know, these, these frameworks are kind of antithetical to each other, right? I think what would have to happen is um, we would have to, the, the hybrid that would be created, if insofar as the hybrid can be created, we would have to also be acknowledging that it is also a critique of the founding as well, the final product that we have. I mean, and I mean, and we, we also can't pretend that our current, well, that's, a, that's another topic, but we already in so many ways, we've departed from the founding and the vision that was there in all kinds of places, right? So America is kind of constantly recreating its own identity and then only after the fact thinks about its continuity with the founding. So that's just something, those are just some of my comments there. Mm -hmm. So like the, before I get on to the next question that I was thinking of prior to this, uh, you know, for me, like the big sort of elephant in the room here mm -hmm. is, is democracy itself in the sense that, you know, I mean, obviously, I mean, the, truly, I believe the biggest obstacle to a more intelligent sort of cooperation between an intelligent church and state is that the majority of people do not want that, don't understand it. And then there's a significant like group of people within that majority that are literally almost at the point of total um, disorder, you know, as in, as in not understanding what democratic participation means, um, thinking about the use of force, becoming um, simply uh, disruptive, uh, not being able to, you know, um, act in a concerted, uh, coordinated way, lashing out. I mean, yeah. you know, we, we have like a, a, a growing like political problem where people have, you know, gotten very frustrated and angry, but they don't have the, the intellectual or organizational tools to do anything about that other than be like exceedingly like disruptive, cruel, rude, Etc. And I'm not just talking about like uh, right wing, but also I mm -hmm. mean like across the spectrum. Okay, um, it's just I mean, uh, incivility is a, a, a term used so frequently that it doesn't quite even capture what I'm talking about. But you know, I mean, throughout my entire career, I've I've asked myself the question, and I've never completely been comfortable answering it. But you know, can democracy really function well you know can you can you get a system in which there is an intelligent cooperation such as you're describing mm -hmm. um for the good that can define what the good is that can like act in a way that actually restrains the market when necessary and does what's necessary you know for the environment and and for just human well-being prioritizes things correctly, you know, like what is truly important for human flourishing? No, it's not a happy meal, you know, and stuff like <laughs> that. And, you know, like, it's, I'm just going to ask, like, what your view of democracy is? Like, do you, do you kind of see its problematic nature in the same way? Or do you find some hope in it still? Or, or what? <laughs> yeah, these are, yeah, this, these are, you're all, you're all asking the good questions. Um, the questions that'll get me crucified, right? Um, I think that, uh, we, we, yeah, I, I think uh, democracy, I mean, you know, I think let's just say what everybody knows, which is that democracy is flawed um, and, and critically so. I mean, so for example, as you pointed out, do people, well, the reason why democracy is so popular is because it has the best claim to legitimacy insofar as people feel like they're involved, they're included, they get their voice in, they have some type of actually institutionally built in power, right? So that's why democracies are really popular. Um, but then the other problems that you mentioned, like the actual administration of the, of the state, or they just, you know, uh, or needing to have that coordinated vision in a democracy, it's so disordered and so all over the place that you can't really get a united vision of what it means to, let's say, have an identity, to have, um, you know, a, a common ethic, right? it tends to fray into all kinds of different factions and so on and so forth. And um, so, yeah, democracy there is extremely flawed, which is why I think what 
people, or at least what tends to make people happier, and you see this already within our own society, is that you'll have people subscribe to a thinker to do the, to do the thinking for them. So think about like people who, you know, they watch Ben Shapiro or they listen to all these other kind of uh, media outlets and, and thinkers and philosophers, right? You know, like people who really are huge fans of Noam Chomsky and all that. They have those philosophers sometimes do the thinking for them to be their voice, to be their representative, right? And, and it doesn't mean that they lose their own voice or representation, but they have someone there to do it for them. And so already then we get from this getting away from direct democracy into indirect democracy, but then people want their thinkers to be really good and they want someone who can really manage and give their time and expertise to deal with economic and social problems that they don't have the time to study themselves. So then you get into technocracy, right? Uh, rule by the experts. And so actually the form of government that I'm most comfortable with is something like a technocracy where you have the experts running the show. Although that gets really complicated too, because there are flaws in that system as well. But bottom line is um, when people say that democracy is the best compromise, I'm like, well, it depends on what you think the good trade-off is, right? So for example, some people think legitimacy is so important that the everyday person feels heard, right? That you can trade off everything else just for that good. Whereas I'm like, wait, no, no, no. The other things that we're trading off, like just a stable government or a common ethic, th those are also really important. Um, and so, you know, uh, th that's what I'll say there. Uh, I, I do agree with you, though, that democracy is very flawed. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean, though, that we, we don't have room for people to express themselves. But just... Um, I guess the vision of democracy that everybody can be their own kind of self-governing authority and power, this kind of atomistic understanding, right, of the person, that's where I think things get wrong. But you, the ideally, you would want a government that has some way of including other people and the common person's voice somehow, some way. Or put another way, to better integrate people's genuine voices and their actual interests. And right. Their, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Which to me seems like, if anything, like integralism were ever realized, it would be, it wouldn't just be the center play between church and state, it would be like, also between like the state and, and the family and, and the people and like all the all the intermediaries between the state and, and the family or the individual, that there would be this whole dance between nature and grace at every level mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. seems to me to be what they're calling for in, in in the best instance yeah i mean i totally agree mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um what did you think about the oh, i'm blanking on this, andrew willer jones uh lecture that laurie sent over to you yeah i mean honestly there there's just so many things about that lecture that were beautiful like how we moved from I, I, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but, you know, the, the analogy that he wove or had woven with uh, the four senses of scripture, the literal, and then the allegorical, the tropological, and the anagogical, right? So I should probably break down those terms, right? The, the literal or historical sense is just simply what was historically intended by the letters that you see in the text of scripture, right? So for example, when the law of Moses says that, you know, pork is prohibited, it literally meant, you know, don't eat anything from a pig, right? And then you have the allegorical interpretation, which tries to see how the things fit within the story of salvation history. So it kind of looks at the text, grabs the thing itself, kind of abstracting out, and then connects them together. So to give an example, um, the Davidic kingship, when you look at it closely, uh, it reflects the kingship of Christ that is to come, right? So you see that typological kind of relationship between the things themselves. The anagog anagogical deals with the moral kind of lesson that you get from the text. And then the uh, tropological deals with the kind of uh, mystical eschatological interpretation. So I won't get into that. But the basic point that, that uh, Willard Jones made in his presentation that, um, let's see here, that um, in the medieval vision, 
<laughs> you had the Davidic kingship and so the little historical sense, and then the kingship of Christ together in one. And this, how all that was connected into the vision of the world where the, literally the Trinity, the metaphysics of the Trinity and the peace between the persons of the, of, you know, the Holy Trinity, how that was the framework for understanding peace and order in society, or how even heresy uh, was not just conceived of as violating a religious doctrine, but actually a form of violence, right? That, all of that was incredible. Now, let me get down to kind of um, the, the more meaty stuff, though. So aside from my praises for the presentation, it was really the end of his lecture that um, troubled me in a good way, right? So he talked about how the medievals would see our politics with its emphasis on sovereignty and power and just kind of rights at the forefront rather than rights as kind of, let's say, the organic outgrowth of this council and aid relationship. You know, you, br you bring in rights when you, when you need to, when things are violated. And then once you have uh, reparations and you're all back together as friends and family again, you don't talks of right or talk of rights kind of goes out the window, you know, because there's this kind of silent, implied understanding, right? Um, so the way that he described our politics as a politics of despair, that hits it right on the head. And then when he talks about how if we have this politics of despair where we can't even have heaven on earth, even imperfectly, or we don't even strive to have heaven on earth, then what happens in society is heaven is dispensed with and is kicked into another realm. And that's, I mean, that's something to think about because um, at least in conservative political thought or even in, in classical liberal thought, the, the two are somewhat connected given the history of Western civilization. Um, conservatism and classical liberalism, one of the fundamental doctrines that they have is what's known as the tragic vision. And so the tragic vision is this idea, kind of best articulated by the economist Thomas Sowell, that humans are intrinsically limited. And you, when you push human beings beyond their actual limits, rather than working within those limits, when you try to perfect human nature, and you treat it as something that is malleable by the state, by other you know, institutions, then you get into a state of affairs that is ultimately worse off for human beings. So um, for example, like the most famous defense or way that this has been applied is with capitalism, because the idea is that human beings are inherently selfish. And rather than trying to do away with that selfishness, let's use that selfishness, that self-interest for the good of the common uh, person, the common good, right? That, that's one way in which the tragic vision is used to justify capitalism. Um, it's just necessary built in. Um, so I'm in a conundrum <laughs> because I accept the tragic vision uh, where at least there are, the, the, you know, there's a real human nature and you have to work within the confines of that real human nature. <laughs> and, um, you know, sin, now bringing in my religious worldview, which is Part of my political worldview, um, sin, even if it's not intrinsic to human beings, right? Because it is a parasite. In the Garden of Eden, we were created good. And the fundamental identity of the human person is that being which is created in the image of God. So we were created good. But sin is a reliable parasite. Even if we, even so, even for the person who is under the dominion of original sin, but even for the person who has been baptized has received sanctifying grace, we are still having to deal with that parasite that first corrupted our human parents. And so, you know, to kind of cut the long story short, <laughs> he left some really troubling questions for me to confront, which is, does my, does my own worldview lead to kind of dispensing with heaven in the political realm? Mm, as in um, have, is there a tendency to more or less say uh, salvation and like complete unity with God's will can only happen in the next life. And therefore we can't, we can't really like even come close to that sort of like the city of man and the city of God, this is the yeah. city of man. Um, and so um, what I hear you saying is that the talk kind mm -hmm. of like 
made you question the extent to which that division, not not that the division doesn't exist, because I think we all probably agree it does, right? But, but including Willard Jones. Yeah, mm -hmm. right, right. But that there's perhaps or ought to be more hope for more of the kingdom of God in this world. Yeah, I mean, basically, so, um, right, when I talked about, like, dispensing with heaven, what I mean is this idea that we eventually turn heaven into this totally different realm, mm -hmm. this kind of far off idea, this really nice reality that has no bearing on this world today, right? right? And, I mean, which is the problem with um, why I think so many religious people, you know, when we look at Charles Taylor's work on on secularism, they kind of feel like this, they're doing this weird kind of, they're, they're divided, right? Where it's like, we're in public, we're kind of fitting within secularism, we're, we're doing the things that we're supposed to be doing, using the public reason. But then in our churches, we're kind of finally safe to kind of take off our mask, right, and be who we really want to be. Right. Um, my worry is that given the fact that I do want to be a realist, and I think everybody wants to be a realist to some extent, and but have the ideals, right? But practically, when we apply our realism, do we still just then get secularism again, ultimately, and the sharp division between heaven and earth? Because, um, you know, so, you know, because for example, as someone who wants to be a realist, who tries to strive for that, um, I'll often sound like a pessimist to my idealistic friends, right? Um, and some of my idealistic friends, so for example, let me give you a really concrete um, illustration. So take nuclear uh, de uh, denuclearization, right? Um, I'm in the camp that doesn't believe that we should do away with all of our nuclear warheads because then people are going to, obviously, when, when the question arises, well, what do you do when somebody has doesn't comply with the uh, agreement and has a nuke right then they have power over everybody else right and what do we do then just hope for to, to appeal to their humanity at that point um whereas other people are going to say no you're you're immoral you have such a dark view of human nature swan we should go for denuclearization because that's the right thing to do we're striving to bring the kingdom of god on the earth right and um so then I'm, I'm kind of in this weird place where it's like, do we have to be realists, but then end up, you know, with secularism again? Or do we have to be idealists, but then end up with this kind of, I don't I don't want to say, let me, let me try to think of a charitable way to put it, but a kind of, I would imagine it as basically Sisyphus, mm -hmm. you know, carrying that stone up to the top and then watching it fall and then carrying it again where you know it's not going to work rationally, you know that there's no way you're going to get heaven on earth before Christ returns, but you keep on trying for it anyway. And then you're just waiting for that day when after you've exhausted so much of your life and energy, Christ comes and says, let me carry the stone. So yeah. it's a kind of absurdity on both ends. Perhaps appreciating that you tried, you know? Like, right. Um, yeah. I, I totally get, um, totally agree with the concern that if we try to bring heaven to earth, um, through our political systems, that we are likely to get a worse situation, right? uh, some form of totalitarianism. I think that's been made abundantly clear by history. Um, but, but I think that we do tend to think of one or the other. It's all this or it's, it's all that. And if Christ is king, he's not just king in this other mythical realm, but everywhere and at all times. And if that's so, then um, maybe it's not so much a question of, um, do you strive to bring heaven to earth, but do you strive to um, obey, you know, his commands? Do you strive to um, do, do what he wants? Because he obviously wanted people in this life to um, behave in a certain way. And, and I think if we all did that, we would have a substantially better like situation than we currently have, even though it would still be very imperfect, you know, because we would come, human beings are imperfect, but it would be so much better. And I, I struggle with, yeah, like with the, with the, uh, the binary there that it's the, that it's either this or that, because I don't think that it, that we have to think of it that way. Right. And that and doing so keeps us gives us an excuse not to um, basically be obedient, 
you know, both to Christ and to, and to the church, um, as it asks us to actually do things in the world. Um, so, I mean, is there, does, does that offer any comfort, right? Like that you can be, you can be a certain type of realist. I mean, I totally understand your struggle. I haven't actually thought about that question maybe as much as I should. I, I dis, of course, who doesn't hate nuclear weapons? I probably, if I thought about it, would agree with you that in, in a practical sense, it's pretty darn, it might be even seen as downright irresponsible to, to completely denuclearize in the world mm -hmm. that we currently live in without careful, you know, careful, prolonged like strategy and negotiations and so on. Um, so, you know, I, I feel like I have a lot of realist in me, but I don't see it competing with the, um, the basic striving to uh, actually be obedient, to actually like try to live the life that Jesus kind of modeled and also spoke about. Do they have to be at all like in contradiction with each other? Right. So I don't, I don't, you know, I don't want them to be in conflict with each other. Right. Um, bring, so for, when you talked about um, the idea that Jesus is not just the king of some mythical realm, or we enter into fairyland when we open our Bibles, and then when we come back, when we shut our books, and then we go back to the real world, you know, then all the magic ends. No, I don't want to have that vision of the world, right? And what you described uh, is basically what integralists would call their, their, their doctrine of the social kingship of Christ, uh, whereas this idea that, uh, as in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus receives all authority on heaven and on earth. So Jesus really is the king of the earth, and our goal is to then bring all governments into conformity with the vision of Christ, so that he really is the king. Um, you know, that's our part that we play. Uh, the other thing, too, is, um, we, you know, talking about uh, the church, you know, the, the church, uh, when, when we try to, when we talk about, like, trying to bring heaven down to earth, I think oftentimes, I mean, there are all kinds of theological problems with that kind of language. Like, one is that it's not our place to really bring heaven to earth, right? Um, uh, be, because that's kind of God's divine prerogative. Now we can be ministers and, and instruments of that cause, right? But I mean, the church has talked about how the, uh, literally in, in the catechism and elsewhere, how the church is a pilgrim, how in some sense we are foreigners in this world, no matter how much we try. And, you know, well, we, you know, we, we live under Caesar, we try to cooperate with the state, but then ultimately we know that deep down this isn't quite where we belong just yet, you know? And so, I mean, that might, might be something there with the tension, the tension between kind of on the one hand, the idealist and the other hand, the realist on this question of what's the relationship between heaven, the kingdom of God and the earth. Maybe it's good that that tension remains and what we try and the way that we bridge the tension bridge the binary is we say, we're trying our best to obey the vision of Christ and the vision that uh, of God as the creator of the natural law and so on and so forth, right? Which is why I think at least my gentle cooperation model um, is, is an attempt to try to bridge that tension, but also maintain it. Yeah, and so one of the things that's been really striking to me as I've converted to Catholicism the last year is how utterly, not even, well, I may be ignorant, but like Catholic social teaching in terms of the Catholics I've encountered isn't even on the table. Their, their Catholicism has so bit thoroughly been liquidated just into American conservatism that it just means being pro-life. Um. And I, I was just, it seems to me that part of what the social teaching is trying to get us to do is thread the needle between, yes, we can't make everything perfect. We can't just bring heaven down to earth, but we can also do some things. So mm -hmm. last, last night I've been going through Pius XI's uh, Quadra Gesimo Anno or something like that. And, and the subtitle is on the reconstruction of the social order. Um, 
and what's frustrating to me is like why why isn't that on the table for so many catholics um or am i wrong is it on the table yeah well you know particularly in the american conservative context right we have to think about i think i think for some catholics there's the desire to belong within the nation as well. And so if we start talking about Catholic social doctrine that sounds communist and socialist, mm -hmm. then we make ourselves aliens again. And we work so hard and so long in the history of America to fit in, right, that we don't want to lose our seat at the table anymore and be delegitimated. You know, we, we, we've come a long way from the days of uh, John F. Kennedy, where the U.S. was suspicious of having a Catholic president to now we're under another Catholic president again. And then even this Catholic president is trying to balance uh, the values of the Democratic Party and his uh, belief that he is a devout Catholic. Right. Um, even what was it? Um, uh, uh, Tim Kaine under Hillary Clinton, um, when he was whenever he was asked about uh, his positions on abortion, you could visibly see how uncomfortable he became because he was. I think deep down he is pro-life and he wants to be pro-life, but he also is committed to the Democratic Party. And so he has to have that internal conflict. So I think regardless of if you're left or right, there's this kind of internal conflict and dance between wanting to fit in and wanting to be Catholic. And what often happens is um, people will decide to try and do both somehow, but then ultimately it comes at the price of one or the other. So, I mean, isn't that, I'm going to just be blunt here, isn't that idolatry when, when one decides that one would rather fit in and sort of conform than follow um, Catholic teachings, or to pick and choose, to, to, per, to prefer social acceptance and political acceptance to um, what the church teaches? Yeah, no, it is it is idolatry. And quite literally, when Jesus in the Gospels talks about how you have to place him before even your friends and your family, right? He's pointing out that um, as human beings, you know, we want to have this kind of social acceptance. And so what we'll try to do is we'll try to get both. And Jesus is saying, no, you have to place me first and be willing to lose everything for my sake, because I will reward you. And part of faith is then trusting that if I do lose my social acceptance in place and how long I've worked to build this reputation, that it will ultimately be given back to me um, in Christ's kingdom. Right. There's this image in, in like Walter Brueggemann's, um, he's a Protestant theologian, and he's got this image of basically the Christian as a, um, an exile or, um, yeah, uh, the Christian is sort of a sojourner, a stranger in a strange land. They can't be like fully um, in in league with any empire or any, you know, form of government. But if they do, then they're worshiping that government. They're worshiping empire rather than um, Christ, rather than God. And that's always stuck with me. You know, it, you know, when people have to choose between Christ and their social, um, their social group, right. Or their, mm -hmm. yeah, their social acceptability, there's only one good choice and there's one bad choice. And I mean, one of the sort of the things that we've talked about with other people on this channel is just like, what is the responsibility that pastors, we've talked to protestants so far but we're moving into the well no we haven't you know we're 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 across the spectrum at this point um you know the question is do they have like an obligation to remind people um of the full you know christian responsibility that you have to resist um questions about your popularity or social acceptability whether you fit in what team you're on and so on and so forth and that you really do need to listen not cherry pick when it comes to Catholic teaching, if you're a Catholic, mm -hmm. you know, like, so in, I know that you're not, um, you're not aiming at the priesthood, but you did think about it. And so like, in thinking about like the role of the priest, how do you see that? Like, is American priesthood, like a lot of 
other, I would say a lot of other Christian leadership tends to kind of often dance around that. You know, they will talk a lot about the pro-life position, um, but they won't talk about other aspects of Catholic social teaching that are just as, you know, if we ignore them, are just as deadly to people. Mm -hmm. um, just thoughts on that, like what, you know, what the state of affairs is from your perspective. Yeah, so from my interaction, uh, so, you know, I was discerning with the Dominicans for a few months, and I was seeing kind of firsthand some of the nitty gritty behind parish administration. And even uh, before then, I was sitting down talking to priests from other kind of religious institutes. And they'll talk about how, you know, they'll have people who will call the bishop and complain about something they say in their homily. And then next thing you know, the bishop is cracking down on them or asking them about what happened, you know. And then you have this weird environment where you're trying to shepherd this parish, but then the sheep are biting at you. And then you don't really know which sheep bit you. Um, and then it just sets everything into an awkward dynamic, right? And so you want to, as a priest, have this, ba <laughs> this weird balancing act between, you know, remaining in good relationship with your flock, but also guiding them forward and instructing them. And sometimes what the flock will do is feel entitled enough to kind of use a hammer on the shepherd. And then that kind of gets all things, you know, messed up. The other thing I'll say too, is just re with respect to the flock, with the laity, with everyday people, because we're so politically sensitive and charged, um, you know, for example, like the pro-life cause, uh, you know, in a Catholic church, of course, that's going to have the choir singing, right? Everyone's going to be happy to hear about that, um, or should be. Uh, but in but then let's say things like um, having a just wage, a living wage, uh, you know, thing, or things like the excess of your wealth belongs to the poor, or the universal destination of goods, right? These types of things. If you bring them up, what's going to happen is it's going to hit the the lady and their ears and the political sensitivities that we have as Americans in our current environment, and it's just going to make everything go haywire. Right. And then in that homily, you might not have the time to get into all the nuances and so on and so forth. So then it becomes dynamite. Right. So that and this is the problem, though, because it, it, then it becomes really easy to just kind of focus on the, the vague moral teaching of the gospel, which then becomes something like be nice. But then we kind of treat, let's say, Jesus's work on the cross and the resurrection and the establishment of the church as the gospel. And then all your other social justice stuff is all over here. Uh, maybe there are consequences of the gospel, but they're not also just as intimately tied into the gospel itself. And um, I think I think that's that's a major problem, right? When you treat the gospel, when you treat the main message of Christianity as somehow not in itself containing social justice, but maybe logically implying it, but then we, we have to kind of work on the details privately together on how that all works out. I think that the fundamental kind of, the thing that unites Christ's salvific work on the cross and the resurrection with his moral and social teaching is this idea that the kingdom of God is among us, that the kingdom of God is already here and will one day be consummated, right? So Jesus really did see the world as under a different administration now. And it was through the cross and through the resurrection that he became king. Mm -hmm. So so what could be done to avoid this dynamic? Because I think you described the dynamic really well, um, which is, you know, like I also would self-edit if I thought that the bishop, or in my case, the dean was going to be all over me, you know, because mm -hmm. I said something. Um, it's it's only human. Um, you would you would like to think that the bishop would not be like taking his first cues from the parishioners, but rather from like actually knowing what was going on in the, you know, what was being taught. And I, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's another thing, I guess, like when I, when I converted to the Catholic church, I, I assumed it would be superior in the sense that what was said at the top yeah. would filter its way down and that this is what you would get from top to bottom because it does kind of come across as a hierarchical institution right mm -hmm. and there's some benefits to that right but that doesn't seem to be the way it functions in this country right so you get that kind of phenomenon where one person one person 
can upend the priest by you know calling the bishop who doesn't necessarily know what the priest is saying but he should you know in this kind mm -hmm. of thing um so you know maybe maybe you know that the this is what larry chap kind of said was that the church itself needs to um sort of become more itself in a way to mm -hmm. organize to for you know to be a little less democratic right yeah <laughs> There we have like democracy sort of infiltrating the church at a variety of levels where people get to sort of in effect vote for what kind of content they're going to hear. And then that leads to priests and, and pastors and other churches do the same. Um, just sort of talking in really vague general terms to avoid um, facing anybody's wrath, but then they've abdicated their role as actual moral leadership pure and simple nobody mm -hmm. knows what they said they go away they don't have any idea they if you ask them right after they walked out of church what did you just hear they wouldn't be able to tell you and that's not mm -hmm. entirely their fault. um so like <laughs> i don't know what my question is except for like thoughts on the on the american church you know like how it's organized how it operates well i'll say this um in terms of the what priests can practically do or even ministers in general well, well priests in particular uh when they're preaching i think the best thing that you can do is like cite from the papal encyclicals cite from the ordinary magisterium of the church show that this is what has historically been taught cite from the church fathers right because i think what ends up happening is if you're dealing with catholics who are you know they claim to be conservatives uh, but then they don't want to hear about things that sound socialist. But what, what you do and you cite an authority is you put them in an awkward position where they have to either choose now between being what they perceive as conservative or being Catholic, right? And then what hopefully will happen is they'll see that their, their Catholicism needs to be the superior in informing their conservatism, what it means to, you know, be, uh, to having their political perspective. Because when you look at the authority of the popes and the authority of the fathers and what they do in a universal way teach on social matters it's neither let's say libertarian nor is it full-on communism it's something almost transcendent of those categories but still incredibly powerful uh, for for us today um so i think that if if there was a willingness to kind of teach these things and cite from the authority of the church and put the two together and actually kind of illustrate the, the the middle way that the church presents i think people will be really attracted to that idea that there is a middle way that they don't have to go on either extreme and that the church provides that with authority the other thing i want to mention when you were talking about the dynamics between the parishioner and the priest um, is i think we've lost this idea to some extent of the fatherhood the the, the good masculine traits of the priest, the bishop, and the pope. And what needs to happen, I think, is we need to see, and I mean, so one word that I don't think anybody is going to associate with the Francis papacy is masculine, right? Because generally speaking, I love Pope Francis to death, right? He is the Holy Father. I accept his authority as a successor of Peter, right? But I mean, th there are times where you have to kind of see that Pope Francis has not dealt so well with certain um, issues. For example, I think his relationship with the Latin mass community is incredibly strained. I don't think a lot of people really perceive Francis as someone who's preserving the tradition. And the default in secular culture is to view him as a kind of liberal pope. But then when in reality, you see that Pope Francis actually says things that are very conservative, right? Or when Pope Francis tries to use his kind of, let's say, um, his moral credit to kind of give a middle way uh, pr position. Uh, you know, and I, I could go, I could give examples, but I don't know if I want to do it here just yet. Um, whenever Pope Francis tries to give that middle way, nobody listens because we've already dubbed him a liberal pope, right? And so I think somehow the pope needs to, in a very kind of direct way, in a very fatherly way, you know, show that, okay, look, no, we have to accept the authority of the church. We have to accept the authority of the ecumenical councils, including Vatican II. We also have to accept the validity of the traditions of the church, including the Latin mass. 
we need to have this pope who is going to be very masculine with this middle way. And then what ends up happening, hopefully, is that the bishops will reflect that kind of masculine fatherly strength in giving the people a middle way, but with the authority of the church. Because I think, you know, the things that you believe uh, in terms of social and moral doctrine, they have the authority of the church behind them. And that's something that if a conservative is properly oriented, is going to listen and perk their ears up to because they want to obey the tradition and the authority of the church. Well, guess what? The social and moral doctrines that you think are socialist are part of it. So I think that hopefully that top-down example would effectively, you know, um, deal with some of the problems that we have. The, the idea of a good masculine fatherhood is missing from the priesthood. I think I basically agree with you. I think I would say a lack of, of true leadership, right? Yeah. It's like just actually possessing the authority that they have. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's, you know, that's why I was attracted to the church to begin with. And it's been kind of disappointing when, when you don't see it, I think people crave that, right. They want to have some leadership. They want it also to be reasonable, not just like, because I said, so that's not masculine yeah. authority either. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that that's often what people kind of default to if they don't know why, you know, because they haven't bothered, bothered to figure it out for themselves too. And I'm sure there, there are some priests that fall into that category. Because um, the issue, um, you know, when I was in the novitiate with the Dominicans, one of the elderly priests, he said to me, there's a point in every son's life where he has to forgive his father. And I think a lot of the kind of traditionalists who are angry at Pope Francis or even the post-conciliar popes, they are kind of disgruntled sons who could never forgive their father. And at this point in the history of the church, uh, these individuals, they no longer view the Pope as a father. Hence, you know, the, the chair of Peter is empty. You know, they feel like their father has abandoned them in a sense. And I think a lot of the people who are angry with Pope Francis, they don't view him as a father. They view him as a boss, somebody that they had just have to deal with and tolerate and live under. And so that's why the image, I think, of a father is so important for not only getting, being able to use that capital to assert with authority, right, but also able to being able to propose a middle way and work on dialogue with the people. That image of fatherhood is so important to get both nuances. Yeah, one of the, in, in Schindler's book about politics of the real, one of the prescient points he made i think i'm sorry he made i think is uh that in modernity we've lost authority we just have power and it's all tied yeah. up with that sovereignty that willard jones is talking about we just have this arbitrary play of con you know contesting claims of power instead of legitimate authority that at least theoretically could uh generally command obedience fealty what have you mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, your point about like the arbitrariness of power, I think is really key because, you know, um, at least within what with like the loss of a natural law framework, a lot of God's commands and authority were perceived as just under a voluntarist framework, where God just commands. And that's the basis for our moral obligations and duties. But there is no, let's say, natural internal logic to it. There's nothing rooted in our nature and our flourishing. It's just God from on high has made the divine command. There are our obligations and duties. And so then at that point, then, you know, that filtered into government and then made power just seem arbitrary because it's not rooted in any deeper sense of the good. And, and there can be no genuine integration. It's just contesting wills that are opposed yeah. to each other. Yeah, I mean, and the example that Willard Jones used of the um, the hanging of those uh, was it those criminals who made counterfeit money, and they were trying to figure out at, uh, the what was it the the various people were trying to figure out on whose gallows these criminals should be hanged. Um, for us today, we'd be like, who cares? Just get the job done, right? Like they were guilty of the crime, okay, you know. But then they actually thought that no, these little details matter, and they can be scientifically in a way figured out and solved, you know? So it wasn't just arbitrary. It wasn't just 
you know, we wrote it on a piece of paper that this is the law, there's the law. It's like, no, we are actually coming to an investigation of the nature of justice and on whose gallows this person should be, um, you know, punished. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that framework between just the, the two opposed uh, unintegratable uh, wills or parties that, that leads into like one of our pet issues on this is, is talking about the environment. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we wanted to get your thoughts on like what Catholicism and um, your take has to say about the environment. Um, and, and it seems to me that part of why it's so hard to talk about the environment is we basically see it in the same terms that there's the environment and then there's us and our ability to uh, convert its bounty into uh, plastic and comforts. Mm. Um, yeah. Would you agree with that or, or what do you think? Well, in terms of the environment, um, I think the first thing I'd want to begin is just discussing the reaction of some conservative Catholics to the environment. So whenever you mention it, right, they roll their eyes. And it's not because they don't care about the environment, right? But it's because one, when they hear their priest or bishop or pope talking about the environment and environmental issues, they see it as an attempt to be kind of popular with the progressive liberal agenda to kind of show that they're in it and cool with it, right? Or, or this kind of, let's say, um, kind of worldwide global kind of view of things rather than actually something more concrete and practical, right? And so they view it as basically virtue signaling. Uh, and so they, they, they're, you know, people don't like hearing about it. But when you look, look at, like, at least other conservatives, what they've said about the environment. So even conservative philosophers are just conservative individuals. You know, they're going to take a, like, let's take a conservative individual, like someone who lives on a, let's say a conservative who lives on a farm, right? He takes good care of his land. He cares about how things look. He cares about the flowers. He cares about um, if there's a, you know, if some bureaucrats trying to build on his land some ugly train station or um, some, you know, gas station or something like that. You know, uh, for conservatives, one way to appeal uh, to them with the environment is maybe a kind of aesthetic argument, a kind of argument also of legacy, of being able to pass on something to your children that's beautiful and not kind of um caught up in this kind of machinery of the world right something that can be this plot of transcendent land of an access to beauty and the legacy of the family so um my position on the environment is well one is that you know i i do like that conservative defense of the environment where it's for the aesthetics and the sense of home in the world to some extent and that sense of legacy but also just in terms of like just hard uh just you know, ethics, right? Like when you damage the environment, you're also damaging human life. Um, you don't, you know, so some people kind of get annoyed because they think environmentalism and veganism go together. And it's like, well, are you saying that then, you know, I can't, I have to care about um, animals as much as I do humans or something like that. And I think the, the proper response is, well, one, I mean, I, I think that when you look at how the environment and even animals and the, li the, the life and flourishing of animals ultimately affects human life as well. Even if you have this anthropocentric view, you should be concerned about the environment because it all is connected and gets us back to um, you know, our, our, our shared existence on this planet. So um, the last thing I wanted to talk about was you mentioned how some people see themselves as disconnected from the environment. And I think in large part, it's because we politicized the environment so much and people nowadays, you know, they hate politics or they're annoyed with it. They don't want it to become their religion that when you bring up the environment to them in a political context, they don't want to hear it. But when you put them on a plot of beautiful land and then you watch them care for it, you watch them care about the animals that live on it. You watch them walk through the fields with their children and look at the animals and care about, let's say, if their child sees a horse and loves that horse, then they want to take care of that horse. You know, um, I think that the reason why we feel disconnected from the environment is because we politicized it to death rather than ha actually have gone out and experienced it and felt any deeper connection with it to our own humanity. Well, I, yeah, I totally agree with that as far as it goes, because, you know, we, yeah, 
definitely have politicized it. And I would I would say that their initial instinct to think that their priest is virtuous signaling is probably correct because he probably is mm-hmm. in the sense that, you know, most people, including our ministers, mainly talk and we have a tendency in our society to equate talk with action as though if you say a certain thing, you have now acted in its favor. But there has been no material change whatsoever. So I I think that's not a bad like um, initial take when you hear people just sort of talk about it in in uh, kind of uh, pious terms, right? Um, but we are also separated from the environment because we live in um, such a structured, constructed human-made environment, right? Like our whole economy encourages us to be removed from the environment. That's been the quest for like, what, 150 years is to become as as like distanced from the environment, from our food sources, from, you know, knowing how it works as we humanly can, you know, like as part of like, you know, we specialized everything, we've outsourced everything. So only a very small number of people are those farmers who even them are not really like dealing with the land. They're mainly in tractors or behind a desk, like looking at a computer. You know, we've automated um, so much and most people get their food in little tiny plastic packages and from the grocery store. We drive around in cars encased in plastic and metal. (laughs) <laughs> we air condition, we heat, we do this, we do that. So the human ideal has become, you know, separation from nature and our economy thrives on that. So, you know, to, to sort of fight that impulse is, is made that much harder by the fact that our very like economic existence, most of our jobs are wrapped up in that distancing and mm. ignorance of, of the environment. And then that's where the aesthetics come in. And from my perspective is when you've lost like the visceral understanding that the environment can kill you, but also feeds you and so on and so forth, then you know your best hope of connecting with it is to, is to connect with the beauty of it, which is also true too, or the sublime. We have a class gonna happen um, later on in the summer on the idea of the sublime that can kind of remind you of the grandeur of nature and the power of it. And then that reminds people of God. Um, I mean, it's part of the reason why people have such a hard time connecting with God too, is because God is very evident in nature, but we've done everything we can to enclose ourselves in a plastic bubble, right? To, To avoid it. So, I mean, this isn't really a question, but I wouldn't mind getting getting your reaction to that, right? That um, it's like the aesthetic route is second best. Our ancestors understood that it was something to be feared and something to be grateful for because they literally understood their lives depended on it. But we've forgotten that. Yeah, I would say that, um, you know, when you talked about how nature can simultaneously feed and destroy, right? Um, we, we even talked about this in, when we were reading Taylor, just how nature, um, at least with, like, let's say in a, po- uh, in a in, well, in our Darwinian kind of framework, right? Nature is now viewed as just this really hostile, brutish, cold reality. And it's something that we want to escape from. And we kind of, with when we see within ourselves, our kind of own organic, natural tendencies and so on and so forth we want to somehow remove our own kind of brutish cold elements if you will and evolve into something better into something greater and that's why you know people are so interested in digital immortality and other things because i think there's almost a sense in which we are embarrassed of where we came from and what we're trying to do is escape nature as much as possible and transcend it and become something rational and immaterial You know, we want to escape our embodiment and be like the angels or something like that. And we think that that's the way to go forward. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a neo-gnosticism. That's what it is. Um, Yeah. So those are just some thoughts that I had there. Thank you. Yeah, Mm. that's that's the opposite of incarnation, right? Like the Mm. 
the model that Christ gives us is God coming into the world and making it holy. Um, yeah. And here we are trying to escape it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we just view material things as things to be used and kind of just dismissed and dominated, right? Whereas with God, you know, his glory fills the earth. His glory brings ordinary things into the extraordinary and the extraordinary becomes part of everyday life. Um, whereas with a lot of way, the ways in which technology is used and the kind of framework that comes with it, it's the desire to kind of escape the primitiveness of nature and evolve to something greater. Mm -hmm. Right. And I guess what, what keeps me up at night, I mean, here's just a little story that during part of my RCIA program, uh, the bishop came and spoke to us and somebody gave him a layup about, I don't even, I don't remember what the question was, but he went on this, this deal about how, like, when he was a kid, there was an ambient cultural Christianity. And now even, you know, now we're free to decide our own gender, you know, so fr from the sexual revolution to, you know, transgenderism now, and I'm, and everybody's nodding along and like, I, you know, I'm trying to be a faithful Catholic. I agree. But I look over and we have plastic water bottles and mm. like hostess donuts or something like that. And I'm like, we literally have trans foods. You know, it's not real food. It is subnatural food. And we all take that for granted. Mm. And, and it, it never occurs to us that like, maybe to some extent, so many kids are trans now because we've absorbed microplastics and hormones in our food and, uh, emf from all of our devices and it it's more of that split between our culture and our ideas about things catholics they want to talk about that but they don't want to talk about the ways and we're complicit with industrial oil and degrading the environment and how maybe actually it's connected to what we think we're fighting mm. um how would you I don't part of me saying that I feel like I'm being overly hysterical, but I'm pretty sure I'm not the crazy one in that room. But uh, what do you think? And feel free to tell me I'm crazy. Well, uh, you know, um, I think it's the first time that I've heard someone really make that connection. And so I don't want to dismiss it as crazy because I don't know enough to say anything really <clears throat> informed about it or even enough to really dismiss it. Right. But when you talk about, uh, you know, Catholics being complicit with the things that maybe, you know, we preach uh, against, uh, you know, something over here, but then we don't see how another thing that we're doing is connected to that. I mean, that's, that's the whole conflict, right? I mean, that's what we're talking about before between, you know, American uh, Catholics, regardless of if they're liberal or conservative, trying to fit in into the American political system, and then they don't see how they're in conflict or how they're compromising their Catholic faith to get acceptance, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it never occurred to them that the two could be in conflict. Like the rich young ruler, he'd never saw any conflict between his wealth and his righteousness until Christ kind of brought the conflict out at that moment with him. Mm -hmm. So that's something we're thinking about. Yeah, to me, it's even more direct. I agree with Spencer that there's a great likelihood that all that stuff that's now in our bodies does affect us. Um, in a lot of ways, probably is a main cause of cancer too. Um, but just the fact that we live in such an artificial environment and that we actually look at a host, you know, like a plastic encased, whatever the heck it is, you know, hostess thing that's there, you know, that is a completely unnatural thing that human beings, even probably what, like, oh, at least, you know, maybe a hundred years ago, let's be safe, would, would not even recognize as a food source, right? It would be absolutely bizarre. So of course, living in that kind of environment where you can get anything you want and it usually isn't even recognizable as what it purports to be, um, makes one feel as though everything is fluid, right? Everything, everything, everything is a matter of construct, you, you know, so, so they are totally, totally related, you know, mm -hmm. one totally feeds into the other, and they both are products of, of the general liberal uh, framework, way of thinking, you know, that mm -hmm. has led to this, to where we can't even recognize, 
our own, what we put into our bodies. So why would we think the rest of our lives would be recognizable? You know, like the natural framework that you talked about earlier, it relies on people understanding what nature is. Mm -hmm. you know, not just human nature, but nature, period, right? Having a connection with it. And we've totally lost that. So I think that there's something really, you know, for, for all of us to think about, like you can't, you can't totally un untether yourself from nature in one area of your life and expect it to adhere in another. Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. We need to we need to talk more about that. We only have so much time, but like that might be something to talk to talk about more in a different conversation. You know? Um, yeah. Just really quick though, I think it's an interesting um, thing to think about. Where you know, let's say a child is raised in an environment where they see nature more often than machines and, you know, uh, the artifacts, basically, in the philosophical sense. Um, th I feel like that child would have a greater awareness of what is given, what is objective, what is kind of almost beyond human control and construct. Whereas the child who's just raised, <clears throat> where everything is constructed, where the nature, there isn't much of the given, only of what is constructed and manipulable, that would also have an impact surely on that child's view of the world. And so maybe that's the connection or that's something worth considering and thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I don't wanna to go too far down this rabbit hole, but I think that is one of the more salient trad critiques of, of the Novus Ordo is that mm -hmm. a, part of what they're getting at with the reverence is that, a lot, a lot of, and I don't know, I'm not an expert in this, but I've heard them say that part of it is, you know, by just handing, handing the host to whoever wants to come up and the, the loosening of discipline all over the place has, mm -hmm. has taught people to be irreverent towards God. And then why wouldn't that flow towards them, um, towards other people? I don't know, just to connect it to earlier in the conversation, but yeah, also, also a good point. There's some good connections being made here. Um, we did we did want to ask you because we are a part of the Catholic worker movement at this point. We've, you know, um, Spencer and his girlfriend Emily are kind of heading up the John Paul II worker Catholic worker farm in Kansas City. Um, and I definitely support them. And the Morin Academy is basically that farm follows falls under the overall umbrella of the Morin Academy. It's part of our mission. Um, and so, you know, we wanted to ask you what you thought of that, especially in light of the fact that Dorothy Day is in the process of canonization. And this could mean that more Catholics learn about her and the Catholic worker movement. Um, are you familiar with it? And just like any general thoughts on, on its place relative to Catholics and, and the Catholic Church? Right. So with Dorothy Day, I know the basic outline of her life. And then in terms of the Catholic worker movement, um, I've heard here and there what it's about, but I don't think I've ever really like stepped in to the movement or experienced it or seen all the bits and pieces. So my knowledge is limited in that respect. And what- and, Totally fine. <laughs> yeah, and since you're familiar with her bi biography, what do you- mm. What do you make of her, if you have anything to to say about her? Well, one thing I like about one thing I like about her personality is that she seems like the type of person who she's she's got this kind of roughness to her that's very appealing. I don't know how else to put it exactly, but you know, she said like, "Don't what is it? Don't call me a saint. Don't dismiss me that way." She was very open about her flaws, her limitations, about the pains in her life, about the sins that she had committed. Um, but she sought something higher than herself. She sought to really make, let's say, human life better for others. And there was a concreteness about her, a realism to her, a grittiness to her that I really appreciate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, that's what's drawn us to her and, and mm -hmm. Peter Moore and kind of the idea guy behind it is that they are examples of Catholics trying to integrate all of their lives. Um, yeah, Peter Morin was kind of on fire for Catholic social teaching. 
Mm -hmm. he's, he's a French peasant who came, I think he went first to Canada, but then the United States, he was a laborer for a while, but he was, he was brilliant, you know, so he found his way to basically um, trying to, trying to teach the American working class about Catholic social teaching at a time when, um, you know, the, the fear of the church was that um, the the social that I guess socialists would get there first, you know, like the um, the the sort of atheist socialist movement would mm. get there first. And so, I mean, part of Catholic social teaching is trying to address real needs um, from the perspective of the church, rather than waiting for some other like organization to come in and guide the working class. So uh, Morian was just on fire for it and you know the, the, he he came met Dorothy Day they formed a team and and they started the whole idea of um you know Catholic worker house, houses of hospitality of um roundtable discussions where people of all kinds could learn and debate about Catholic social thought um as well as agronomic universities where people could learn how to actually um grow their own food and take care of themselves and each other um, and also learn from each other at the same time. So, so we've taken that general framework and um, thought about, you know, how, how you implement that in the 20, 21st century setting, you know, um, but totally agree with you that both, both Day and Morin were like very real you know, people, that grittiness that you, that you notice comes from just having lived a really like interesting, but also very flawed, mm -hmm. you know, life, but in conversion in the case of day, just, you know, then devoting her entire life to this cause and particularly to the cause of the poor and the poor working class. Um, so this is, you know, and, and all across the world, there are these houses of hospitality now and a growing number of um, farms as well. So that's, that's our inspiration. I don't know, you're the guy on the farm, Spencer, you should. I, I don't have, I don't, I can't say it better than you did. <laughs> Uh-oh, <laughs> we're in trouble. <laughs> um, so anyway, like we 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 hope that we can represent it well over time, and we hope that you'll kind of keep track of us and what we're doing as as we keep track of you and what you're doing too, as we do appreciate mm -hmm. what you do. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll say this: um, one of the things that I've noticed in my life is, you know, I'm I'm kind of you know I'm moving and doing a lot of things, a lot of academic things, and all that. Um, one thing I really do care about is the pro-life movement. And I try to, you know, with the channel, the money that I make to give to a pro-life charity. But in, in terms of the social and moral teaching of the church, I'm sure that once I'm kind of, let's say, more settled down, right, and not just kind of always in the flux as a student and trying to go to grad school and then get a PhD and all that, um, that'll provide me time to really kind of also want to put myself, let's say, into a life of advocacy, right? Um, because I think, you know, what you're talking about um, in terms of having communities and having these conversations and living together and living for the poor and making the social and moral doctrine of the church actually part of your daily life, that sounds very appealing. It sounds like something I want to do. And um, it's something that I think would help, you know, uh, resolve this kind of division that you sometimes feel as a religious person living in a secular world, because then your life and the moral teaching and social teaching of the church, they're just one and the same at that certain point in the worker movement. So that sounds like something I'd like to look into in the future. Yeah. You know, it reminds me, um, there's a conservative philosopher named Ryan T. Anderson. Um, and he was kind of, you know, he was educated at Princeton well known for, you know, the issue on a Bergefell v. Hodges defending the conservative position and all that. Um, and, you know, if you keep up with him today, 
after the whole thing kind of, you know, after, you know, Obergefell v. Hodges was decided and he commented a little bit on the transgender uh, debate, he's now settled down as a goat farmer. <laughs> he's kind of gone out of that whole political crazy sphere. And, you know, that honestly sounds like a very appealing direction to go in. So, Spencer, the fact you're on a farm, I think, is, you know, very, it's a wise decision <laughs> and a decision I'd like to make one day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you, I would imagine when when he's had some of the the fancy dinners and all the glasses yeah. tinkling, and you find out how much good did it really do. Mm. Um, yeah, I totally get why you you would settle down, tend your own garden. Yep, and then do what you can. Be grateful for what you've got, mm -hmm. and it's plenty of work so yeah keeps him grounded haha -ha. <laughs> <laughs>